court. Uh, shout out to that boy Donald Trump. I know everything ain't going good in the White House, but shit, you gotta turn that shit around in 2020. Uh, the mock. Derek, you hit that guy with bombs. Were you surprised that he was able to endure those shots? Yeah, for sure. I really tried to hit him in that booty hole that he got on his chest. But shit, my hands are too wet. I know he like a raw in that ass. So, it's my fault. Uh, okay. Listen, Derek, congratulations on another amazing performance. It's always a pleasure to watch you fight. Good luck to you in the future, sir. Welcome to episode number 27 of the MMA Rundown podcast. Uh, obviously, that was one of the better post fight interviews we've heard in a long time between Derek Lewis and Joe Rogan. Uh, last time we had Derek Lewis doing the My Balls Was Hot, and Joe Rogan had the response, I understand this time it was, uh, I know he like it raw on that ass, and <laughs> Joe Rogan's response was, um, okay. Uh, so, good job by both of them. I, I know Joe's kind of acting in the spot and didn't really know what to expect, but I'm okay, I think it was a perfect response to uh, everything that Derek Lewis just said. But as far as what we'll cover, we'll talk about the main event between Jorge Masvidal and Nate Diaz, with Masvidal getting the win and getting the BMF belt wrapped around his waist. Talk about The Rock uh, having his entrance, uh, where he came out to his music and then presenting the belt. A lot of people seem to enjoy it. A lot of a lot of other people seem to get really annoyed about it and think that it was like too much WWE for a, an MMA event. Talk about the rest of the card. UFC 244 it was a fantastic card. A lot of great fights. So there's a lot to go through there. Uh, talk about Donald Trump and his presence at UFC 244. There's talk about him going to, I believe, a Conor fight earlier on, and he didn't end up going. This time he actually did come to a fight. Instead of going in a, into a box and just kind of like staying up in the rafters, he decided to actually like go down and go to the second row. Um, there was some argument about whether or not he was getting booed or cheered, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about everything there. Then we have a preview for this upcoming event in Russia, which will be headlined by Zabit Mag- Magomed Sharipov and Calvin Cater. Uh, also, Greg Hardy will be fighting Alexander Volkov on this card. We've got Connor possibly having an, another fight booked. I, I've really been holding off on talking about Connor because a lot of times he just he talks, but there really doesn't seem to be any sign that anything's going to happen. This may or may not be a, a similar situation. At least we know that the date he was talking about exists. That that date on the calendar is going to happen in terms of I, I think it's MGM Grand and on January 18th. Dana doesn't seem to think that the fight's set right now, but there are a couple options being talked about, so I'll, I'll discuss both of those. Look at what's going on at middleweight right now with um, Yoel Romero had a fight with Paul Acosta. Acosta got the win there, and it looked as though he was going to be next in line for a title fight. But it looks as though Acosta now has a serious injury that he has to have surgery from and recover from, and it looks like they're going to move on. It's not said who he's going to fight next, so I'll talk about his options there. And then the last thing will be a big boxing fight between Canelo Alvarez and Sergey Kovalev. It was being held up so they could wait until the end of the main event of this MMA card, and there have been some takes on that in terms of, well, Canel's getting paid $35 million, and he's waiting on Diaz and Masvidal, and Masvidal aren't making that much. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about the whole situation then in terms of some of the criticisms I've seen about it, whether or not I think those are fair or not. But back to uh, the first topic to talk about, and that'll be the main event of UFC 244. That was the fight between Jorge Masvidal and Nate Diaz. To me, before this fight happened, the way I saw it is like, I felt as though Diaz has a lot of openings and he's probably going to get caught with some big shots. And the question for me was, will Diaz be able to take them, survive, and then be able to, to come on strong late? This fight didn't really ever get to the point where he, could, where he could come on strong late because after the end of the third round, he ends up getting these cuts and he, he gets taken out. Now, with that being said, Masvidal, it's not as though Masvidal landed a couple big shots here and there that, that sort of would push him back. He was landing big shots consistently, and as a result, Diaz really wasn't able to put the pressure on him that he normally puts on other fighters. Yeah over the course of the first three rounds. So while it's it's likely that Diaz still would have been there and still would have been able to keep a decent pace in rounds four and five, it's not as though he was really doing a ton of work in the first three rounds to to, to really make Jorge Masvidal really tired. And Masvidal was doing a smart job. Um, every time Diaz would come in, he'd find a way to clinch up with him and use that clinch sort of to catch his breath and to get like an active rest. So to me, if this fight had gone another two rounds, I don't think it would have been a case where Diaz would have been able to wear down Masvidal. I think Masvidal is actually doing a very good job of managing his energy and seemed to have plenty of energy left after the end of the third round. So to me, had this fight not been stopped by a doctor stoppage, it still would have been a, a pretty clear win for Jorge Masvidal. So Masvidal impressed me in that way. I, I didn't expect him to to pace himself as well. Didn't expect him. I, I expected him to land a few good shots, but I didn't expect him to consistently land big shots on Diaz over and over. If you look at the final strike counts, it's a little odd, uh, where it says 114 for Masvidal to 125 for Diaz, but the significant strikes is 112 for Masvidal to 43 for Diaz. 
so I'm not sure where those 82 strikes came from for Diaz, if they're counting some of the Stockton slaps from bottom when he was in his guard at the end of the third round or what they're counting exactly, but either way, really good performance by Masvidal. I think for him, with him getting the win here and getting it the way that he did, he's definitely got a good case that he should be getting a title shot right now, which is a little surprising to me, uh, given the fact that Leon Edwards also has a great case for it. Uh, but just kind of the way that timing works out and the fact that marketability really matters in this, Edwards is going to probably need another win. And I think the idea of him fighting Tyron Woodley will make a lot of sense. It'll give him a chance to, to fight the most recent champion. If he gets the win there, then... I think at that point, you, you pretty much have to put him in there in a title fight because everyone who he's, ha- who he's had to fight, he's been beating. So the only guy I think who has a win on him is Usman. And I guess for that reason, that might be the one reason why you're, you're not pushing him into a fight with Usman just yet. You don't want Usman's first title defense to be a guy who he beat along his way to get to the, to the title. But, man, Edwards has really, really done a lot for himself. The Masvidal-Edwards fight also is a fight that makes a lot of sense um, given the fact that there was that little three-piece in a soda exchange. Uh, but I think right now, both of those, more more so Moss at all than Edwards, but you could argue both of them are sort of like in, in an on-hold situation right now. We're going to wait for December 14th, see who wins between Colby and Usman, see how healthy the winner is. Uh, and then in all likelihood, one of them is going to get the title fight. But to me, after this, it looks as though Moss will be the one who gets the title fight. Edwards is probably going to get one more fight. And um, if he gets his win, then he'll probably get a title fight somewhere down the line, but not too far down the line. Moving on, um, we had The Rock coming out. Obviously, The Rock um, gave the belt and wrapped the belt around uh, Jorge Masvidal's waist. There's a lot of complaints that I saw online about The Rock coming out to his WWE entrance song, him getting a big cheer, him having the belt, uh, showing the belt around. And people felt as though it was a little bit off-putting. And I feel like I, I just keep repeating this over and over, but because there are so many people who seem to be missing the point, I feel like I have to. If you run a professional sports league, if, if you are a professional athlete, more so the professional sports league. The professional sports league, you are not in the sports business. You are in the entertainment business, and there's a there's a difference to be had there. If you're making money as a professional sports league, what you are doing is you're getting people to say, hey, look, I work Monday through Friday, but on Saturday I'm free. Uh, on Saturday I want to be entertained. I have options out there. I have movies. I have places I can go. I have things I can do. What I'm going to do is, say if I'm in the New York area, I'm going to go to Madison Square Garden and watch the fight. If I'm at home... I'm not going to go out, or maybe I will go out and go to a sports bar to watch it, but I, I'm, I'm going to take the time that I would like to have spent entertaining myself, and I'm going to watch the fights. And with MMA being an entertainment business, with, with this being entertainment, having a guy like The Rock, who's a great entertainer, who, who comes from WWE, I, I don't have any issue with it at all. I don't mind him being there. I don't. I like the fact that the fans enjoyed it. Uh, I think it was pretty cool that he was able to put the belt on the champion's waist. The guy's got a huge following, so the fact that he was posting about it all the way along and drawing a lot of attention to a UFC event it's definitely a good thing in my book so personally I have no issue with it as far as the comparisons between the WWE and UFC what I think people have to keep in mind is that the WWE does weekly events in arenas and they frequently either sell it out or sell out a majority of the tickets and this is for an event that everyone knows isn't real they know the matches aren't real they know it's scripted so you have all these sports where like oh we're we're a sport we're we always go by meritocracy and merit this, and it, it's all about what, what happens on the field, what happens on the pitch, and that nothing matters more than that. And the WWE taking a different approach is saying, hey, look, we we don't really care about that as much. We're, we're here to tell stories. We're here to entertain people. Not only have they been able to have a successful business where they're making money, but they're making a lot of money. They're doing really good. And they just signed a huge TV deal with Fox for SmackDown, which I think is actually like their lesser of the two brands. So obviously the WWE is doing a lot of things right. The fact that they have E at the end of their name, with it being World Wrestling Entertainment, they, they really understand that they're in the entertainment business. And, and by really leaning into that, they've been very successful in what they do. And I think even if you don't like the idea of the WWE not having actual competition where the matches are staged, the fact that they understand the enter- entertainment angle so well and have been able to su- succeed so well, it's really important for other sports, and especially another fight sport like MMA, to, to take some notes from there and say, hey, look, yes, we have a real sport. No, they don't. But that's not... It's not as though that's the only differentiating factor there. There's a lot of things that are similar between the two. And the fact that the WWE understands the entertainment angle and they're able to play into it so well and make so much money as a result, there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. And I, I think it's important for, for other companies to learn those lessons and to, to act on that. So to me, no issue with The Rock being there. I think it was a, a good thing to have him there. And if he wants to come to some other events in the future, that's great. If other pro wrestlers who have big names want to have, 
come to events, that's great. If it keeps people entertained, great. That's that's what you're there for. Uh, so as far as the rest of the card for UFC 244 goes, we have Kelvin Gastelum and Darren Till in the coming event. This is a fight I was talking about beforehand where I was saying that a lot of people were thinking that this was a terrible idea for Darren Till with the idea being, hey, you, you're, you're coming off of two finishes, uh, one Tyron Woodley where you, you, you get knocked down and then caught with a darts choke off your back, uh, and then you have the really bad knockout loss to Hori Masvidal. Why take a fight against a guy with really good knockout power guy who's at the top of the division? Uh, seems like a terrible idea. And, and the point I made was, like, I, I can definitely see Gaslam winning this fight. I'd probably pick him to win this fight. But if Till gets the win here, then he immediately inserts himself in the top of the middleweight division. And if that if that happens, and I think people are going to be looking at this as a good choice, because had he gone in there and fought against, like, a say, Brad Tavares, we'll, we'll, we'll pick another guy on the card, say that he, he comes in and fights Brad Tavares and he gets the same result, He's not in as good of a spot right now as he, as he is now that he just beat Kelvin Gastelum. So for him, put himself in a good situation there. Now, granted, by him not having like a dominating win or a win where he like knocks out till or knocks out Gastelum or drops him multiple times, it's not as though people are going to be like begging to see him in a title fight right away, which I in, in one way could be a good thing for him. Um, but he still gets the win here. It's good for him. It's good for him to get that rebound. And now wherever he's going to fight next. You can start making a different storyline and just say, oh, well, yeah, he had those losses at Walter Wade, but that's because he was cutting too much weight. Now he's at the right weight class, looked good against a former title challenger, looked good against a guy who not only was a former title challenger, but a guy who was tied two rounds apiece with the current champion. So for him, it, it definitely makes him more mar- more marketable. I, I think there's a decent chance that he might be able to headline event headline an event the next time he goes out there, especially one that is across the pond. So all in all, everything worked out for Darren Till. As far as the actual decision here, I wasn't so sure that Till won this in the same way that a lot of other people online seemed to be. I wasn't watching it, like, as a a judge, and I think a lot of those rounds were pretty close to the point where you kind of had to, like, be counting strikes and be really paying close attention to it to determine who would win. If you look at the final strike counts, this isn't round by round, but this is just in total. Uh, Gaspillon landed 50 to Till's 37. He landed 40 significant strikes to Till's 36. Uh, Final decision was 30-27 for Gaspillon, 30-27 for Till, and then 29-28 Till. Um, so, it's not as though this was like a blow-up for Till. Till did a really good job of constantly circling to his left, and as a result, he was able to take away Kelvin's best weapon, which is his uh, straight left or overhand left, uh, depending on what angle he's trying to hit it from. Uh, did a pretty good job of not really sticking his feet and, like, getting stuck in a, stuck in any exchange. It was just kind of, like, picking him apart, like, one or two shots at a time. Uh, so, at least from a strategic standpoint, it was smart. Uh, not always easy to, to knock someone out if you're not going to set your feet or if you're not going to try to land one or t- more than one or two strikes at a time. But with that being said, you're dealing with a dangerous guy who's really good at closing the distance and showed that against Israel Adesanya. And Till was able to pick him apart and do just enough to, to win the fight in a couple of the judges' eyes. So for him, big win. Gives him a chance to headline an event moving forward. Do I think he's next in line for a title fight with Paulo Costa being out? No, I don't. But it's still pretty important for him to actually get this opportunity here, for him to get the win and depending on the availability of other middleweights and depending on if they're going to try to wait for a later a later event for him to headline, uh, it'll be interesting to see who he fights next. But probably not a title fight, but whoever he gets next is probably going to be one of those guys where if he gets a win over them, he may be in line for a title fight. So for him, you take a risk in fighting a guy like Kelvin Gastelum. Um, the worst case scenario is you get knocked out again, which isn't great. Uh, best case scenario, though, is you win and you put yourself into the title picture right away and he gets the win, he puts himself in the title picture. Um, Got to respect that. Next fight to look at is Steven Thompson and Vicente Luque. This is a fight where, when I was talking about beforehand how I thought this would go, I figured that Thompson should be able to outland in volume. Uh, the question would be, is Luque going to be able to close the distance, land a big shot, and then take advantage of Thompson's chin, which seems to have been getting worse as time goes on. Did hurt him in the first round, but Thompson was able to, to stay on his feet at that point, uh, was able to recover and continually outland uh, Vicente Luque. Luque actually did land a lot of pretty, pretty good shots here, but he took a bunch as well. Showed a great chin, got dropped a couple times, but never got to the point where he was able to get finished. Uh, looked as though Thompson might be able to finish him. I believe it was in the second round where he dropped him and was landing a bunch of hard shots on the ground, but Luke did just enough to survive. But unfortunately for Luke, uh, the big shots that he landed were close to the fence, and I, I don't know that Thompson would have fallen down had the fence not been behind him, but it definitely helped have the fence there to keep him up. And as a result, never really was able to drop him, wasn't able to like catch a darts in a scramble, which is something he likes to do. Uh, and as a result, the fight stayed on the feet for the most part. Thompson did a fantastic job of constantly changing angles, constantly um, getting his reads right on Luke. One of the crazy things to me about this, and I'll talk more about it with the Gregor fight, 
is that when you're fighting a guy like Gregor Gillespie, for example, it, it's not as hard to get a read on what he's going to try to do and then try to figure out what a good counter is and execute it. Um, but with Vicente Luque, he was mixing it up fairly well, so the fact that he was mixing it up well and Thompson was still reading him extremely well and still finding counters, finding a way to slide out of the way of whatever Luque was throwing and land his own shots was really impressive to me. And it, it was nice to see what sort of amounted to like a vintage Wonder Boy performance there. And for him to get a win like that, people seem to have forgotten already, but Masvidal has a, a pretty a pretty decisive loss to, to Wonder Boy. Wonder Boy was right there with Tyron Woodley. I don't know that Wonder Boy is in the title picture just yet, but he was in the top 10 before this fight happened. He'll, he'll still be mid to high top 10 now. And with a, a bunch of the top welterweights now fighting each other, now getting to a point where they're going to start knocking each other off, uh, he may be able to eventually slide in and be a fight or two away from a title fight on his own and especially if the champion is someone who he hasn't fought before, and that's a, a, a skill set or like a style match that people think is going to be tough for the champion. It wouldn't shock me if he finds his way back to a title fight. He, he's going to have to protect himself. He's going to have to make sure that his chin holds up in his next couple of fights. Um, he was doing very well against Pettis before he got caught. Uh, that Matt Brown fight from a while back, he, he got dropped. He, even in wins that he's had, though, he's been dropped. He, even in losses, he's been dropped, too, though. He, he, he got dropped by Woodley, I think, in both fights. Got dropped by Darren Till. Uh, so for him... It seems as though with most fighters out there, he's going to be able to outland him on the feet. It's just a matter of once once he does have to take a couple shots, and oftentimes he's going to against these top guys, is he able to able to eat it and keep moving forward like he did with Luke? If the answer to that is yes, then it, it might not take him long for him to be back in a, in a, in a, in a title picture, and that's pretty cool. Uh, next fight before that was Derek Lewis and Blagoy Ivanov. This was one fight that was very difficult for me to, to try to figure out how to score, in that... The way that I like to look at scoring is that the winner of a round in general should be, if you're going to win a round, you're either just going to win it out right where you get a finish, and then at that point you don't you don't just win the round, but you win the fight. But you're just going to be the guy who, it's either the guy who who finishes a fight or gets who makes the most progress towards a finish over the course of a round. And when you put it in that in that way, and you're not specifying striking or grappling, you're just talking in terms of a general finish because this is this is MMA. Striking's a part of it. Grappling's a part of it. In both the first and the second round, Ivanov had Derek Lewis down, had him in side control, and had some decent key lock attempts. Especially in that second round, that one was really looking close. I, I thought Lewis was done for. Um, so when you, you look at a very close submission attempt, how do you rate that compared to, say, Derek Lewis landing some big punches? Um, that makes Ivanov stumble but not drop. Like, like, like where does that score relative to, to itself? Like, how do you compare a, a close Kimura to a punch that stuns someone? And to be honest, I, I don't know that I have a great answer for that. And, and as a result, it was one of those fights where I, ha I had money on Derek Lewis, so I was kind of biased, and I, I just wanted to see Lewis win. But to me, had Ivanov gotten this decision, and it was a split decision, I don't know that I would have been that mad about it. Uh, final scores were 29-28 Lewis, 28-29 Ivanov, and then 30-27 Lewis. So the 30-27 score, I'm assuming, is coming from a guy who didn't put a whole lot of stock in those in those near submission attempts. Uh, the 29-28... For Ivanov could have been someone who did put stock in those submission attempts and was scoring uh, those rounds in favor of Ivanov when he was getting close to finishing there. Ivanov was definitely landing on the feet as well. It's not as though he he wasn't landing any shots himself. If you look at the final strike counts, uh, total strikes was 32 to 61, uh, 61 for Ivanov, 32 for Lewis. Significant was 31 for Lewis to 20 for Ivanov. Uh, Ivanov was constantly looking for a big overhand left and with Derek Lewis keeping his right hand hand down the whole time, uh, kind of figured he'd probably be able to find it at some point. It looked like he landed a couple big ones, but never enough to actually drop him and get the finish. But in the end, Lewis definitely had the strikes that appeared to be more significant. Looked as though he was closer to finishing this fight on the feet. Even though I was closer to finishing it on the ground, but how much did he score that? Looks as though the, the judges here decided to to score a little bit more for Derek Lewis and, and his shots on the feet than even Ivanov and the work he had done on the ground. Um, because it was a very competitive fight, and because Lewis actually did land some really hard shots on the feet. I, I don't know that I'm that mad about it. There's some other fights where the fight might be kind of close on the feet where someone might have a slight edge there, but then the other guy gets close to a submission on the ground and they give it to the guy who had the slight edge on the feet. I think in that case, you definitely have to give it to the guy who had the advantage on the ground. Um, but man, Lewis was landing some serious shots on Ivanov. I guess it, it's also difficult with this because a lot of the shots that Lewis was landing, it, you would think with most heavyweights, he would actually be able to put him down and finish him there, whereas Ivanov was just eating him and staying on his feet. So... If someone lands a giant overhand right and his opponent gets dropped, you probably have to score it more so, more so than if he lands the same shot and the opponent just kind of like stumbles back or just kind of like backs up and takes a couple steps back and puts his hands up. Like you, you can't score the two the same because they don't have the same effect, even if it's the same exact shot. 
but I, I guess for some refs, you're, you're used to seeing Derek Lewis just blow people away with those shots, and you see Ivanov um, still saying there, you, you still want to score for Lewis and still want to give him credit for it, but man, this is definitely a fight where I, I have to watch it again, and have to watch it kind of like with the judge's eye to see how this fight should have gone, but to me, when the fight was over, I didn't think that there was like a clear winner either way. And the first fight on the main card was Gregor Gillespie and Kevin Lee. This is a fight I was talking about beforehand where the winner of it is going to put themselves in a great situation in terms of making an argument that they should be a fight or two away from Khabib and Romero, maybe two or three. With the reason being, if Gregor Gillespie gets the win, he has a style that's very similar to Khabib in terms of having high-level wrestling and being very good at grappling guys on the ground, being able to control them and being able to beat them up on the ground and then work his way towards submissions. And then Kevin Lee, he, he'd been making an argument for a while that he feels, feels as though he's just the worst style matchup for Khabib Nurmagomedov. Feels like he would just run through Khabib. Khabib doesn't match up well with him at all. And so for him, with him getting a fight against a guy who's the most similar to Khabib in the division, maybe outside of Islam Makachev, for him to get a dominant win, then that sort of makes his argument seem a little bit more more plausible. And with him getting the win that he the way that he did, uh, I, I think a lot more people believe in him now than they did prior to this fight. And especially with him taking a fight against a guy in Gregor who was undefeated, a guy who no one wanted to fight, you have to give him a lot of respect for it. And you definitely have to give him credit for getting the win the way that he did. Now, what I was talking about before with the Wonder Boy versus Luke fight relative to this, I'd done a, a little bit of a recap with Gregor Gillespie after his last fight against Yancey Medeiros, uh, just talking about how he was doing both on the map but also on the feet. And one of the points that I'd made in that is that what Gregor was doing was fairly simple, and, and the point I was making is, like, what he's doing is very effective, and so you, you, you can't blame him for doing what works for him. The question is, if, if he's dealing with a guy who he can't take down or he can't easily take down, um, what more are we going to see from a striking outside of what we're seeing? Because a, a lot of what he was doing was just kind of like the same thing. Like, if it was the lead hand, he was kind of like try to throw a jab and then work his way in, um, or he'd kind of like duck down and throw the overhand. So in that way, you could kind of tell what he was doing. If you were seeing some motion from the right side, you knew what kind of punch was coming. If you saw some motion from the left side, you knew what kind of punch was coming if he was going to punch. And he mixed it up a little bit more in this fight. He was throwing some uppercuts. He was, he was starting to mix around his punches a little bit. But for the most part, it was still a lot of the same punches. It was getting a little bit predictable. And what ends up happening when he gets finished is he goes forward and uh, throws a jab. Lee reads the jab. And what impressed me about Lee is not only did he kind of slip the jab and counter it uh, with an overhand at himself, um, but after countering with the overhand, he then stepped forward as Gillespie was backing out and then threw the, threw the high kick and was able to catch Gillespie as Gillespie was backing out. So the, the, the boxing counter in and of itself, um, just being able to sl- slip the jab and then throw the overhand on top of it, that was really nice by Kevin Lee, and depending on where that lands, sometimes that can be enough to, to rock someone and put him down. Uh, but for him to follow that up and then land a head kick right after, just a fantastic job by him. Liked how he was fighting in a low stance, liked how he was sticking out the jab, sort of like... Um, in a way, is a little bit, a little bit reminiscent to what we've seen from GSP in the past. I'm not saying that Kevin Lee, Kevin Lee looked like GSP in this fight, uh, but it seems as though the work with TriStar definitely paid off. Uh, it seems like he had a really smart game plan here. His jab was looking, was looking sharp. His striking was looking sharp. Uh, counter wrestling was effective. Really, only got one shot out of Gillespie because Gillespie really didn't have any any openings to to go for him. I mean, there was a really good job, or a really good job was done by Kevin Lee in terms of sticking out the jab and making it difficult for Gillespie to find his entries. And as a result. Um, Pretty much what we saw in this fight was Kevin Lee keeping range with, against a guy who wanted to wrestle him, um, making reads on that guy and his striking, and then once he made his read, um, finding the perfect counter to it and putting him out and putting him out brutally. So for Kevin Lee, fantastic win. He's calling out Islam Makachev next, which sort of seems like the Betch Kohea um, strategy in terms of how to get a title fight, where back when Betch was fighting at 130, well, she's still fighting at 135, but back when she was working her way to a title fight, uh, she was just picking off all of Ronda Rousey's friends before Rousey eventually took a fight with her. Uh, it seems like now with Kevin Lee getting the win over Gillespie, it's kind of like, all right, now I just beat a guy who's just like you. Now I'm going to beat your protege. If he gets the win over Makachev, yes, Makachev isn't ranked uh, like top 10 right now, so it's not as though it'd be like the most impactful fight from a ranking standpoint, but you're definitely going to get Khabib's attention with a win over Makachev. Um, and at that point, I don't know that that fight would be enough to put him into a title fight, but... If he if he now now after the win over Gillespie if he beats Makachev and then beats a top five guy, uh, there's there's definitely an argument to be made that if Khabib's still the champion by then if Tony Ferguson hasn't knocked him off if no one else has popped in and been able to knock off Khabib Nurmagomedov that Kevin Lee might find himself in a title fight and after a performance like this that we just saw against Gregor Gillespie, it, it's a lot easier now to imagine Kevin Lee beating a guy like Khabib today than it was yesterday before that fight had happened. So for him, job well done, great performance. 
for Gregor, you, he took a long time off in the first place between his, his fight with Yancey Medeiros and this fight. I think part of it was just because he had a hard time finding people to match up against. Uh, probably going to want to take a similar break now just to, to fully recover. And I, I, I don't know if there are going to be a lot of fighters who are going to see this knockout loss and think, okay, now I'm ready to jump in with, with Gregor. I think a lot of people still realize that he's a fantastic grappler and still a terrible matchup. So it'll be interesting to see where he gets ranked after this, uh, who wants to step in and fight him. But either way, great fight for both of these guys um, to take. Uh, tough result for Gregor, fantastic result for Kevin Lee, and definitely look forward to seeing him fight Makachev if that's the next fight. And if he gets the win, man, like, <laughs> it, it doesn't seem all that long ago when Kevin Lee was a guy who people were looking at as a future champion. He's a guy who had a, a shot at a belt against Tony Ferguson, ended up losing that, joining that fight with a an apparent staff infection, which apparently was the case here as well. Um, doesn't seem like anyone asked him directly about what was what that little lump on his chest was, but it seemed pretty big for a pimple or an ingrown hair. So whatever the case is with Kevin Lee, dude's got to got to make sure his chest is clean. Got to got to deal with that because if it was a staff infection, he's lucky he got an early finish here. Because if you got Gregor Gillespie wrestling you for a couple of rounds and you're getting exhausted by the end of the fight and you've got a staff infection to deal with too. That's not a great, not a great matchup or not a, uh, a great situation to be in. So fortunately for him, it worked out this time, but you don't want to put yourself in any bad situations like that where you're having to fight um, with reduced cardio because you've got a staff infection in the future. And on top of that, it's, it's not fair to your opponent. It's not fair to anyone else who has to share that cage later on in the night. Uh, Cause you could imagine like if Kevin Lee gets cut open or if that infection starts like oozing all over the place and then you got four other fights afterwards, um, that all eight of those fighters are not going to be too pleased about having to to sweat and to get cut and to to have their empty empty sores or their um, their open sores uh, rubbing up against that uh, in the later fights. As for the prelims, we had Corey Anderson versus Johnny Walker. This was a fight for Johnny Walker where had he gotten a very impressive win, there's a chance he could have leapfrogged Dominic Grace for a title fight. Uh, for Corey Anderson. I don't think anyone really expected, even with a dominant win, for him to be able to leapfrog Corey or leapfrog uh, Dominic Reyes. Uh, as it turns out, Corey Anderson get the, did get the win here. Walker, the way he fought here was very interesting to me in that you could tell from the outset that he was concerned about Corey Anderson's wrestling, and he's a lot more tentative in this fight than he was in previous fights. He's thrown a lot of feints early on, just trying to get his reads, uh, but it really seemed like he was a little uncomfortable closing the distance, didn't really want to like throw like too many flying attacks where he can get countered and taken down. And I can understand understand that from the start, but the thing is, is that eventually he did get taken down, and Anderson wasn't terribly effective in, in holding him down, which to me was a pretty big surprise. Uh, so for Walker, both being able to defend some takedowns early and then also being able to to get back up when he did get taken down, you would have figured that as the round went on, he would have grown in confidence and been willing to throw a little bit more, but it still seems like, even after he was able to get back to his feet, was still trying to wait for the perfect shot, still trying to was still limiting his offense a lot. And so had this like not been an MMA fight where you're where wrestling is an aspect an aspect of it, I, I think he definitely would have been a lot more aggressive. But because it is MMA, because wrestling does matter, because Corey Anderson is a, a pretty good wrestler, uh, Walker seemed a little bit more tentative than I would expect from him. Um, this is a guy just in general who oftentimes keeps his hands down and throws a lot of unorthodox shots from, from unorthodox angles. But with him being a little bit tentative and Anderson being very aggressive in this fight, Anderson was able to, to find a home for his overhand right, uh, was able to drop Johnny, and once he had him dropped, just... Stuck all over him, just kept landing shot after shot. Uh, had him down. Anderson, or Walker was able to get get back up to his feet after getting put down, uh, even while he was rocked, which, again, was pretty impressive to me for Johnny Walker. I didn't expect him to be able to work his way back up to the feet, especially if he was rocked. Uh, but then for him to get back up and then get caught with another huge right and put out, or it, it, I, I guess he wasn't put on, put out unconscious, but it looked as though had the fence not been behind him on that on that final shot, he would have fallen down again, and that's, what, that's why the ref jumped in and, and stopped the fight. Anderson then shushing him and like yelling at him after the fight. Uh, it's pretty weird. I don't I don't know what was personal between Walker and Anderson. I, I understand the idea of Johnny Walker was very annoying to, to Corey Anderson that Walker's this new guy gets three wins and all of a sudden people are talking about him at, him for a title fight while Corey Anderson's been hanging around the top fifteen of the division for a long time and no one really seems to want him in a title fight. So I get the idea of Johnny Walker being a frustrating thing for for Corey Anderson, but for him to like be taking it personally with Johnny Walker, I, I thought that was a little bit odd. Uh, showed a lot of emotion though afterwards, which for Corey Anderson seems a little bit odd. Uh, I guess unsurprisingly for Corey Anderson, not long after that fight was over, he had apologized for it and said he didn't mean any of it. Um, but for him, big win, uh, definitely a memorable win. Not just over a guy who a lot of people are interested in watching, not just in a fight that a lot of people watched, but 
for him to get it that way, I think that's going to help him out a lot. And for a guy who I don't think anyone really wants to see fight for a title, if he does get a fight with a guy like Anthony Smith right now and gets a dominant win over him, he, he could be in line for a title sooner than we expected. So good for Corey Anderson. For Johnny Walker, uh, at least here we saw in the UFC some openings in terms of him leaving his hands down and him leaving himself open to, to get some huge shots landed on him. Hadn't seen a whole lot from him in the prior fights just because they were so quick. Uh, so moving forward, he's probably going to get a little bit of time off between now and his next fight. Uh, but whoever fights him next, it'll be interesting to see depending on who the matchup is. If it's another wrestler and he he really gets tentative and doesn't want to get himself caught in any positions where he's going to get taken down, similar situation can happen. If he goes up, goes up against another striker or someone else who he's not worried about taking him down, uh, he's more willing to like, throw some of his unorthodox shots, kind of throw the flying knees from everywhere and uh, throw all the, the weird tricks that he has. It'll be interesting to see uh, how that works out as well. Because he has beaten some decent strikers uh, prior to this fight, but it seemed as though the threat of the wrestling really, really stunted his offense. And for a guy who isn't terribly defensively sound, your offense really needs to be firing off so, so you can make it as though your, your best defense is a good offense. And with a good offense not being there, his defense wasn't able to hold up, and we got the result that we got. Uh, other prelims to look at, we have Shane Burgos getting a win over Maquan Amir Khani. Amir Khani looked pretty good for the first three minutes, although... I don't believe he has a folk style wrestling background. I think his background is freestyle, and that sort of worked against him, because even though he was able to get some takedowns against Burgos, he really didn't do a great job of controlling him on the ground, and Burgos was constantly working his way back up. Mach 1 would then have to use a bunch of energy to get another mat return. Burgos would get back up, a bunch of energy used, get another mat return, and it, it, it looked as though by the end of the by the end of the first round, for sure, Amir Khani uh, had spent most of his energy and had 10 more minutes to go, and... That really didn't work out that well for him because Burgos just started hunting him down, was able to defend a lot of takedowns. A lot of times when he would stuff a takedown, Amir Khan would just kind of like stop on his knees and sort of like lean back, even sometimes like inviting him into his guard, which was really odd. Uh, but Burgos would just keep having him stand up and was landing a bunch of huge shots, um, big shots to the head, really good combinations, a lot of good shots to the body, and eventually was able to get the finish um, towards the end of the third round. Then we had Edmund Shavazian versus Brad Tavares. Really big opportunity for Shavazian against a guy in Tavares who was ranked, I believe, number 11 going into this fight. Uh, a guy who had fought in the main event against Adesanya, and Adesanya had used him to springboard his way towards the top of the division. And Shabazian made pretty quick work of him, only took him two and a half minutes, uh, rocked him with a with a big, I believe it was a right hand. Um, and then as Tavares was coming back up, um, landed a few more shots, had a combo at the end that got the finish that sort of reminded me of what we see from Robert Whitaker a lot, where he'll, where he'll throw a punch and then throw a head kick from the same side. So typically when you're throwing strikes, you're going to throw left, right, left, right, left, right. Uh, and that includes when you're mixing in kicks as well. So if I throw like a right hand, I'll, throw, I'll follow it up with like a left kick. And what Tavares, or not what Tavares, what uh, Whitaker likes to do a lot and what Shabazzian did here is he'll throw a punch with one hand and then throw a kick with the same side. Uh, so I believe here he threw a jab and then threw a head kick with his lead side. Uh, so left jab and then left head kick. And the left head kick landed flush and knocked out Brad Tavares. So really big win for Shabazzian. Shabazzian's a guy who, like Macy Barber, is one of these guys who ha- has time to be the youngest UFC champion ever if uh, if all the cards align. Unlike Macy Barber, I think he he might have a decent argument for, for being good enough to do it. Um, that being said, a lot of the fights that he's had so far, he, he's been winning on the feet. Has decent boxing, definitely has good power. Uh, ha- has some good kicks as well. Uh, unfortunately for him right now, the guy who's the champion of the division is a much better striker than he is. Not to say that Shabazzian's a bad striker, but is- Israel's just incredibly high level at striking. So for that particular matchup, uh, that might not work out well for him, but th- there could definitely be matchups out there where Shabazzian might be able to find a w- way to get a win. He's got the power to do it, where even if he's fighting a guy who's better than him, if he's able to land his shots, uh, he-, he can definitely stun you and finish you. So it'll be interesting to see where he goes from here. I don't know who they're going to look at get- putting him up against next, where they're going to with him just beating number 11, if they're going to go to, like, number 9 or go something, like, so slightly incremental like that, um, if they're going to just push him up really quick right now and even give him a guy like a Darren Till. I don't know if they go, they go that far right now, but he's definitely been looking pretty pretty impressive. Had a lot of quick finishes so far. In, in a way, I'd like to see him fight someone who's going to be able to, to draw the fight out a, a little bit longer so we can actually see, like, really see more from his striking, but also see more from his grappling, see really where his game stands right now. But everything we've seen of him so far looks really good, so... You get, you get a really dominant win over a top 15 guy like this, you're, you're going to get another top 15 guy next, and if he keeps winning this way, it won't be long before he, he's able to get himself a title fight. Um, so, can't wait to see what's next for him. And the first fight on the ESPN2 prelims was Andre Olaski versus Yarzinho Rosenstrike. Uh, Rosenstrike kept looking for that left hook. Um, wasn't a very long fight. 
lasted under, under 30 seconds, but Rosenstrike kept looking for the left hook. Uh, it doesn't look as though Arlovsky had made that read. And what I thought was kind of interesting is right before the final combo where Rosenstrike, or I guess it wasn't a combo, it was just a, a left hook moving back. But right before the final left hook, we actually saw Rosenstrike sort of like throw that hook out there and kind of pull it back because he was out of range for it. Uh, so you could tell he was looking for it, but Arlovsky still came in, came in with his right hand down, and as he was going in for uh, a combo of his own, ends up getting clipped and put down and Rosenstrike. Um, obviously, there's a lot of power in his hands uh, for him to be moving backwards. It didn't even look like that left hook like landed with full power for Rosenstrike, but it was still enough to, to catch a guy who was coming in and put him down, face plant him. So big win for Rosenstrike. Uh, you, you figure he's got uh, some top 15 guys up ahead of him as well. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see who they put up put him up with next. I know a lot of people prior to this fight were hoping to see him against Greg Hardy. Hardy's got his hands full now with Alexander Volkov. I don't know that Hardy versus Rosenstrike is a fight that's going to happen anytime soon. If Hardy gets the win over Volkov, maybe they give him a guy like Rosenstrike next. If, if he loses, which is what I expect, I don't think Rosenstrike's a guy who he'd be facing. I think he'd be going back to fighting unranked guys. Uh, but as far as other guys to, for him to fight, I think it's not a super deep division. Maybe give him a guy like Sergei Pavlovich. Um, but for him... Really big opportunity now. He's 9-0. Gets one over Andre Arlovsky. Gets that one pretty dominantly. Uh, so you figure that he's going to be having a number by his name uh, when the new rankings are released. And we'll see where he goes from there. For the early prelims, we had Kaylin Chukagian versus Jennifer Maya. Chukagian wins this fight uh, on all three judges' scorecards, 29-28. I was sort of watching this fight. Had the fight on mute because it was a Kaylin Chukagian fight. And you can't watch her fight without having it on mute. Otherwise, you're going to drive yourself insane. Um, so... I don't know that I have a whole lot, whole lot of commentary other than that. Kind of unfortunate that she's probably going to be main, going to be main eventing a fight sometime soon, and I'm going to have to mute that as well. But look, if you're going to just make a bunch of obnoxious key eyes and make this like a, an obnoxious tennis match, that's you, you're not leaving me any choice. Uh, then we had Lyman Good versus Chance Rank Counter. Uh, Good landed uh, a giant shot at the end of the, or in, in the middle of the third round, was able to get the finish there. And then Hakeem Duwadu with a split decision win over Julio Arce. Alright, so, a lot of stuff to talk about there with UFC 244. Not quite done with UFC 244, though, because i got to talk about uh, one of the big stories here, which was the fact that the President of the United States decided to attend the UFC 244. Uh, one of the angles that people looked at here was, while well, Colby's been doing so much to get in his good graces, and he, he goes and watches his Jorge Masvidal instead. I, I guess it's not as though it's official right now that Trump won't be at UFC 245 as well. I, I'd be surprised if he goes back-to-back to, back to two straight UFC pay-per-views. But with that being said, um, he, he's got Trump Tower in New York. He's got a place to stay. At. He, he's very familiar with New York, so for him, uh, going to a big event in New York made, made a lot of sense. The location worked out for him. I have a feeling had Colby gotten on this card against Kamaru Usman, he, that Trump would have still been here. So I, I don't know that this was like him taking a, dip, a dig at Colby or anything. It's just this was a, car, a fight card that worked out well with his schedule, and that's, that's why he was able to go, and it seems as though he enjoyed himself as well. There was some talk about whether or not he got booed or cheered. Um... He's in New York. New York's a blue state. He's also a guy who's fairly divisive, so just about any crowd he goes into, unless it's like a rally of his, you're going to have people there who are thrilled to see him. You're going to have people there who don't want to see him at all. People who are thrilled to see him are going to cheer. People who are not thrilled to see him are going to boo. Uh, if you're in a section where you're hearing a lot of boos in a mixed reaction, it'll probably sound like he's getting booed pretty bad. If you're in a section that's cheering a lot among the mixed reaction, it'll sound like he's getting cheered a lot. And it seems as though that's kind of um, what a lot of people in the stadium were saying is that Depending on where they were sitting, it was either the, as though he got just a giant cheer and everyone was happy to see him, or that he got booed really badly and people didn't want to see him at all. But to me, reaction aside, I don't, I don't think it really matters. I mean, for him, it seems like he had fun. Uh, it's kind of odd that he chose to sit in the second row rather than in a suite. Definitely didn't make the Secret Service's job any easier to have to account for all the fans that had straight line access to him, whether they're throwing something at him or doing anything worse. But Everything worked out. He got out safely. He got in safely. Uh, doesn't seem as though he, he made it very easy for the people who wanted to go to that fight. A lot of extra security. Probably wasn't that easy to get in. Um, and with it being a, a show where over 20,000 people showed up, uh, probably a bit of a hassle for the fans who were there, who there live. But as a fan at home, definitely appreciated it. I thought it was kind of weird that they didn't show him on the on the feed that I was watching on, on the pay-per-view. But I think for the most part, people knew that he was there, and they appreciated the fact that the president of the United States was there, and it was pretty cool for a sport where, if you hear about Dana White's story with Donald Trump, where he was saying back when he bought this bought the UFC, a lot of venues wouldn't even host him, and Trump was there to, to offer up his venue, 
for them to go to, for them to be at that point where they were they were struggling to even get venues to host them, uh, to be at the point where they're at now, where they're at MSG and where the President of the United States is going and watching their events. It, it's definitely a lot of growth for the sport. It, it, it's great for MMA, and when, when you see things like this, when you see when you see the growth, um, not just in terms of popularity in the country, but then also um, financially, it, it definitely helps everyone out. It's good for the athletes. It's good for it's good for fans to to have something that everyone's eyes are on at least for a night to say, hey, well the president's there. What's going on? What's what's up with this UFC event? Um, pretty cool for him after the fact then to be tweeting about Jorge Masvidal, um, congratulating him. So. Always nice when a, a sport like this gets some gets some mainstream mainstream attention like this. I know a lot of hardcore fans don't like it when casual fans come in and sort of inject their two cents into things. But in reality, um, where the big money's made in the sport is, is is from the casual fans. The, the hardcore fans aren't. You, you're you're not going to sell like one point one and a half million or like two million pay per view buys all on hardcore fans. Hardcore fans might account for like a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand pay per view buys at, at any point. So. When the sport's making the most money, when the company's making the most money, it's because they're drawing in casual fans, and things like this definitely help draw a casual audience, so I definitely appreciate it. On to UFC Russia, uh, which is not an intentional... Um, <laughs> it, it, these two topics are not put put together intentionally, um, but you have Zabit Magomed Sharipov and uh, Calvin Cater uh, in the main event. This is a fight that I think was supposed to happen back in Boston. And in one of the podcasts that I recently did, um, when I when I was out of town, I had done a podcast talking about fighters who could potentially offer the worst or the toughest style matchups for the current champions. And a featherweight, a guy who came to my attention as a guy who could offer a really tough matchup for Max Holloway is Calvin Cater, given his really good boxing and excellent power. Not exactly a guy who's easy to grapple, not that Max Holloway would be able to do it. Now, granted, he's not fighting Max Holloway right now. He's fighting Zabit. Zabit has very good wrestling, very good control from top, good guard passing. Uh, seems like he's, got, like he's got some decent submissions. Uh, very unorthodox striking. Uh, has a lot of really good kicks. Uh, very dynamic. His boxing seems to be an area where he's got himself in some trouble. His, his gas tank also seems to be an area where he's got himself in some trouble. Uh, so if Calvin Cater can keep this fight in boxing range, it's going to be good for him. Now, because the main event was supposed to be JDS and uh, Alexander Volkov, this fight is going to be a three-round fight, so there's not going to be a five-round fight on this card. So at least in that way, if it really is an issue for Zabit that he, he's got some gas tank issues, if that's actually a problem for him, the fact that this is a three-round fight is going to help him out a lot, uh, especially if he gets the win, because it's, it's still going to do a lot for him in, in terms of getting himself working his way towards the top of the division. Uh, but for Calvin Cater, you would figure he's got the edge in the boxing here, so the question is going to be, is he going to be able to keep this fight in a in a boxing range and be able to dominate from there? Is Zabit going to work to take him down? Is he going to be able to defend the takedowns? If Zabit takes him down, is he gonna, going to be able to get back up? There, there are a lot of questions about both of these guys that I think is going to be answered here. Um, obviously, with Zabit, the questions around his boxing are going to be are going to be front and center for Cater. How does he deal with a, an excellent grappler like Zabit? Uh, so for me, this is a fight that should be the main event based off of the other fights in the card. It is the main event now, and even though we're not getting five rounds of it, I, I definitely can't wait to see the fight. Uh, then we have Alexander Volkov versus Greg Hardy. To me, the craziest part about this fight, not not so much just that it was made. Um, but was the betting odds here? Uh, let me see if I can pull up what the actual odds were. But I, um, after seeing the betting odds on this, I took all the money that was in my uh, all the money in my betting account and put it on Volkov. I, I think I probably would have done that anyway, even if Volkov was like a ten to one favorite. But the odds just don't make a whole lot of sense to me for for where they had it. Uh, so let me see what we got right here. We had at, at the odds that I bet in on Volkov was a minus two eighty six favorite, so not even a three to one favorite over Greg Hardy. If you're looking at skills from here, Volkov is significantly better than Greg Hardy. Uh, his striking's way better. His grappling's way better. Wrestling's better. Jiu-Jitsu's much better. Um, good at fighting from range. Good at landing body shots. Good at mixing it up to the head. Good at throwing combos together. Obviously, he's done a lot more in his career than Greg Hardy has in MMA. So to me, the only way Hardy's going to win this fight is if he's going to land a big shot. But the thing with Hardy is he doesn't really throw combos that much. It's more so just kind of like one shot at a time. I, I don't figure that being... I just don't expect that to be super successful against Greg, or against Volkov. Volkov's probably going to be able to pick him apart from from the outside. Uh, has a long reach himself. Also throws his kicks well and uses them pretty well to the body. So to me, at range, advantage to Alexander Volkov and tight. I'm sure Volkov is going to have plenty of tricks he's going to be able to use here. So to me, yeah, it's heavyweight MMA. Yeah, everyone's got a puncher's chance, but Greg Hardy should 
should get demolished if we're looking at this from a skill set standpoint. Maybe he lands a big shot, but to me, I, I just don't see how Volkov doesn't win this fight and doesn't win this fight dominantly. Uh, then we have Zalim Amadea versus Danny Roberts. We have Gedzi Murad Antigola versus Ed Herman. Uh, so Herman, I guess, is still going. So it'll be interesting to see him there. We have Ramazan Amia versus Anthony Rocco Martin, who was working his way towards the top 15 at welterweight before losing to Damian Maya, a fight that he dominated in the third round and arguably could have been a draw where he loses round one, round, round one and round two, but gets a 10-8 in round three. Uh, so for him, a good opportunity for him to get back in the win column. And then we have Shamil Gamzata versus Klitsin Abreu. Then on the prelims, we have Magomed Ankalaya versus Dalka Lungi Ambula. We have Rustam Kabilov making his return against Sergei Kandasko. Roman Kapilov versus Carl Roberson. We got Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov versus David Zawada. I believe he was with uh, PFL prior to this, so I think this might be his first UFC fight. Alexander Yakovlev versus Ro- Roosevelt Roberts. Jessica Rose Clark versus Pani Kianazad and Grigory Popov, who I don't think has fought since his lost Eddie Wineland versus Davy Grant. Uh, so that covers the card there. Uh, some other topics to talk about. We have Conor McGregor. Looks as though he's getting pretty close to signing his next fight, although from what Dana White was saying this weekend, it doesn't sound like they've actually like started negotiations on it. Uh, from what reporters have been saying, it sounds as though Cowboy Cerrone is the fight that they're, they'd be looking to make, probably at 155. Uh, but there's a, this other thing that I'm, I'm seeing from a lot of fans come up, and they're saying, why would you want to fight Cowboy? Shouldn't you be fighting Justin Gaethje? Gaethje makes so much more sense. Um, Gaethje would just absolutely run through Connor. With Connor, I get the feeling that he's hasn't been training as much as he used to. That it, one, one of these things with training is that typically if you're training like once a week, you're, you're like slowly getting worse. If you're training twice a week, you're kind of maintaining. If you're training three times a week, then you're like slowly getting better. And the more you train from there, uh, the more improvements you can make. It's not clear how much Connor's been training. So even I, I don't know that he's been training much, but even if he is training, I, I just don't know how often it's been. I, I don't feel like he's gotten a significantly better from, say, like from the Eddie Alvarez fight or even from the Khabib Nurmagomedov Meta fight. But with that being said, a lot of fans who were going out and saying that Justin Gaethje is a terrible matchup for Connor, it's a fight that Connor wants nothing to do with. I don't see that at all. I, I, Gaethje has shown some tactical improvements over his last three fights, but I don't see him being a guy who is just a terrible matchup for Connor. Quite frankly, if we get the Connor that fought Eddie Alvarez, I think Connor's a terrible matchup for Gaethje. With Gaethje, people... Are, it, it, I'm, I don't know exactly what assumptions they're making when they're saying that Gaethje would, would run would run over Connor. If the assumption is that Gaethje, a guy who's got a D1 All-American pedigree in wrestling but hasn't ever really used it in high-level MMA, is going to go out there and take Connor down and beat him up, well, I, I don't know that that's necessarily going to be the case. You have a guy like Chad Mendes who had a higher pedigree than Gaethje did in wrestling, uh, made his entire MMA game around wrestling, and though he was able to take Connor down at times, he really wasn't that effective in holding him down over the course of an entire round and really beating him up and landing major shots. Uh, so the idea that Justin Gaethje would be significantly more effective in that than what Chad Mendes was, I, I don't know that I buy that. But you're talking about it just from a pure striking standpoint. Gaethje is 3-2 and two in his last fights. The two losses that he had were against guys who were much better boxers than him, uh, one being Eddie Alvarez and then one being Dustin Poirier. I would argue that Conor McGregor is also a better boxer than Justin Gaethje is. So if this fight does stay on the feet for the most part, and that's where the fight ends up being, this idea that Gaethje is just going to outland Conor seems crazy to me. Um, yes, the recent Gaethje we've gotten has been a lot more um, defensive. He's been a little, little bit more picky about the shots that he goes for rather than just kind of like swinging forward. But he, he's a guy who still keeps a really high shell, a guy who loses himself open to body shots. And he's been successful in walking forward against a lot of guys, but Connor's not a guy who people typically walk down. Uh, so if they have to meet themselves in the middle, and Connor just starts picking apart at Gaethje's body, kind of like what Eddie Alvarez did, I, I don't see any reason to believe that Connor can't get the finish here. The question would be, is the Connor that we saw against Alvarez and the Connor that we'd seen prior to that no longer there, and and the current Connor is is much worse than that? But but to me, at that point, you're just speculating. You, you you're basically saying I I think that's where Connor's at, but I don't know. So for me, for anyone to to say with any certainty, oh god, Justin Gaethje is a terrible matchup for him, or Justin Gaethje is going to run right through him, you, you can't be 100% certain on that, because if you're basing it off of what you've seen in past fights, that's not an intelligent uh, takeaway to be had. If you're basing it off of the fact that you think that Connor, or off of the opinion that Connor has gotten worse over time, then just understand that you're basing it off of an opinion based off of um, more so what you feel, more so than what you've actually seen. So 
to me, the Conor Gaethje fight is definitely an interesting fight. I don't see it as one where Gaethje is going to run right through him. I, I, I think style wise, it could be a bad, a bad matchup for Gaethje depending on where Conor's at. But at, at this point, it's not the fight we're going to get with with Dana White saying that the Cowboy fight hasn't hasn't progressed. You know, maybe it's a fight we get. I, I would definitely be interested in watching it. If we get the Cowboy fight, Cowboy's another guy where boxing has been an issue for him. Uh, better boxers have given him a lot of problems. Warrior Mouse at all being a perfect example. Uh, Gaethje was able to keep this fight in boxing range and was able to win it in boxing range as well when he fought against Je- when he fought when he fought against Cowboy. So for Connor, boxing being his strength, Cowboy with boxing being his weakness, you'd figure if Connor can keep this fight in boxing range, he would be pretty pretty successful and possibly get a quick finish against Cowboy as well. So I think that's part of the reason why they want that fight is because Cowboy's got a good name. Um, beating Cowboy actually matters. And I think style-wise, it's a win that you could potentially get. So I think that's why that's the fight they were looking for. But it doesn't seem as though the Frankie fight's going to be made. Uh, the Cowboy fight, I don't know that it won't be made, but it doesn't sound like they've really been that active in making it. And the Gaethje fight, um, seems as though that's the one that the fans want most. But uh, again, it doesn't sound as though the UFC is close to, to booking anything yet. So we'll still have to wait and see where they, where they go from there. As far as where to book the middleweight champion, though, we have Israel Adesanya. He was supposed to be fighting against Paulo Costa. Costa was brought ringside um, for the Adesanya versus Whitaker fight. Uh, Adesanya then called him out, looked as though the fight was set. Uh, but now we find out that Paulo Costa had a torn bicep and is getting that repaired. Uh, won't be able to get back to training until April, so it seems as though they're going to have to move on. Right now, Yoel Romero, though he is 1-3 in his last four fights and though he's coming off of a loss to Costa, it seems as though a lot of fans want to see that fight. It seems as though Dana White is pretty open to that fight as well. Uh, Israel Adesanya made it made it known that he's open to that fight as well, so it seems as though that's probably going to be the fight that's made. Uh, Kananir would be the other guy to think about as a potential title fight. Uh, don't know that he's going to get put in over Robert or not over Robert, Robert not over Robert Whitaker, but um, not over uh, Yoel Romero. So it, it seems like right now Romero is probably going to get the next title fight. Uh, depending on where Whitaker's at health wise, he might get a shot against Kananir. So then you could have. Um, have it where if, if Whitaker gets the win there, then maybe he, he works his way back into a title fight pretty quick. Um, they did great business the lot over the, for the first fight between him and Adesanya. So if Adesanya beats Romero and Whitaker beats Kananir, uh, maybe they look to run that run that fight back pretty quickly. Um, it'll also be interesting to see where Darren Till falls into this. Again, I don't know that they're going to be booking Darren Till right away, but when they do book him, uh, it'll be interesting to see where he goes. He, he did go to the post-fight press conference saying that he had blown out his knee and was coming in on crutches. So if that's something that he's going to get rehabbed or surgically repaired, that's also going to slow down uh, the timeline for him. But it looks as though Yoel Romero versus Israel Adesanya is the fight that's next as far as how that fight would look. To me, I think Yoel Romero is one of the more overrated fighters by fans, and that's not to say that he's not good. It's just that I don't think a ton of fans understand the difference between freestyle wrestling and folk-style wrestling. Uh, with freestyle wrestling being a sport where once you take a guy down, you, you only have like about 10 seconds to work there before they stand you back up, where it's folk style. Uh, once you take a guy down, if you can hold him down the whole way through, then that's great for you. You can build up a bunch of riding points. You can turn them and control them. Uh, then you can score even more. Uh, so a lot of American wrestlers who come from freestyle backgrounds, or from folk style backgrounds, they've been very successful in MMA, whereas even though America isn't number one in the world in wrestling, usually um, they're top three behind like Russia and Iran, we haven't seen a ton of Russian wrestlers come over to MMA and dominate. We haven't seen a ton of Iranian wrestlers come over and dominate. Outside of Romero, it's not as though we've seen a ton of Cuban wrestlers come over and dominate. So, a big reason for that is that the U.S. or the UFC is a, a U.S. company, and you're not going to have to pay travel visas for a lot of Americans, so they they, can, they tend to get more opportunities. But at, at the top level, it really looks as though the, the difference between folk style and freestyle has made a lot of difference for that being a very effective um, crossover for wrestlers, whereas freestyle hasn't been as much. And what we've seen from Yoel Romero is, though he has been able to take a lot of guys down, it's not as though he, he dominates a lot of guys once he gets them down. It's not like he's keeping them down, passing their guard, uh, landing a bunch of shots, uh, and, and just controlling once he gets a takedown. Oftentimes they're getting back up, or in, in other times they're just defending his takedowns. A lot of fights he's had in an MMA context in the UFC, he's even gotten taken down himself. So this idea that he's going to go in there, fight against um, Israel Adesanya, shoot a devil on him, take him down, and then beat him up uh, for five rounds or beat him up until he, until he finishes him, that's just not something that we've seen in other fights, so I don't really have any reason to believe that we're going to see that in this fight either. So to me, this would then become a question of how does this fight work on, work out on the feet where you've got Yul Romero who oftentimes likes to wait, 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 and then blitz in versus Adesanya who's who's constantly active, constantly throwing feints, constantly throwing the body to the head, mixing it up. 
um, is Romero going to be too patient against Adesanya and just get lit up to the body to the point where he's not able to manage his gas tank and he's going to get finished? Um, is he going to be able to time Adesanya coming in and be able to land a huge shot, drop him, and finish him? Adesanya has been hurt before in past fights. Romero definitely has the power to hurt him. Uh, Romero's also a guy whose body seems to be made of granite, and pretty much everyone who fights him and lands a bunch of significant shots on him ends up like breaking bones doing so. Is Adesanya going to break his hand throwing a punch? He's going to break his foot throwing a kick? Uh, is that going to have a major effect on how the fight goes? So there are a lot of questions there. I think from a stand-up standpoint, uh, it'll def- definitely be interesting to see if Romero's able to land his shots um, and if he's able to, to injure Adesanya when Adesanya throws. But to me, the idea of this fight being a, just a dominant wrestling match for Yo Romero, I, I just don't see that. But that being said, it, it's still an interesting fight. Just just don't go into this fight with the expectation that Romero is going to just wipe Wipe, wipe the floor without Asani on the mat. That, that just doesn't seem like a likely scenario here. And the last thing to talk about, uh, just briefly, is the boxing match between Canelo Alvarez and Sergey Kovalev. So this was a fight that was broadcast on DAZN. They decided that rather than have the, that fight go on at the same exact time that we had Nate Diaz and Jorge Masvidal, that they would wait for Diaz and Masvidal and then do this fight after. And one of the things I was seeing online is, wow, Kovalev is getting paid like $15 million. Um... Alvarez is getting paid $35 million, and they're having to wait for these guys who make much less. Uh, doesn't that tell you how bad uh, MMA is for the fighters? To me, that deal that Canelo Alvarez has, the, the 10 fights for $35 million each for $350 million total, I mean, great for Canelo. If that's what you can negotiate and that's what you can get, then good for you. But just because that's what he gets paid doesn't mean that that's a good business decision for DAZN. Like, I, I don't know how many subscriptions DAZN has to sell to... To just like break even on that, on that deal, let alone all the other deals they're making. The zones, it seems as though their strategy right now is they're just gonna throw a, a shitload of money at a bunch of different sports properties right now. Um, understand that they're gonna lose money in, in the short term, and just hope that they're able to build up enough of a subscriber base that over time uh, it, it eventually works their works its way back into the black. But to me, the deal they made with Canelo Alvarez is is more of like an aggressive deal where they're they're just trying to get their foot in the door right now, and it's not exactly one that. A business that's been going on for a long time, a business that's been running in the black, a business that's been making money over time would actually make. So to me, it, it more so just says, yeah, Canelo Alvarez got a great deal for him, but he's getting overpaid relative to what his value is. Um, whereas Masvidal and Diaz, I, I don't know if they are. Both of them seem to be pretty happy with the money they're making for this fight. They both seem to feel like they're being paid fairly. So to me, there really isn't like a major fighter pay argument to be, to be made here. Um, yes, it's nice when a fighter, whether it's MMA or, or boxing, gets paid a significant amount of money, but... At the end of the day, if they're getting paid at a rate where it doesn't make a whole lot of business sense for the promoter and the promoter is losing money on that fight, you're not going to be able to do that over time. You're not going to be able to continue replicating that same thing. And eventually, the promoter is going to go out of business and as a result, opportunities are going to go away for fighters. So while it's nice to see an individual fighter make a lot of money on an individual fight, um, if a promoter is losing money, it's not just bad for the promoter. It's oftentimes bad for other fighters who are going to miss out on opportunities in the future. So that'll cover it for this week. Uh, obviously next week we'll be talking about Greg Hardy and Alexander Volkov and then Zabit and Calvin Cater. I'll either be very happy that my entire betting account was returned to me with some extra money on top of it or really yeah, that, mad that I have no betting account left and Greg Hardy has a win over a top eight guy, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens then. Uh, but that covers it for this week.